This morning, Donald Trump just came out and said it. Trump just announced that the whole thing about the post office, trying to defund it, putting in a crony, destroy it from the inside out. That isn't just a secret plot to make it more difficult for people to vote this year. It's now a totally open plot. Listen. Three and a half billion dollars for something that will turn out to be fraudulent. That's election money, basically. They want three and a half billion dollars for the mail-in votes, okay, universal mail-in ballots. Three and a half trillion. They want $25 billion, billion for the post office. Now, they need that money in order to have the post office work so it can take all of these millions and millions of ballots. Now, in the meantime, they aren't getting there. By the way, those are just two items. But if they don't get those two items, that means you can't have universal mail-in voting because they're not equipped to have it. And you see how bad it's been. Yeah, so that's just totally out there. He's saying they want this money so that they can have mail-in voting. If they don't get it, they can't have mail-in voting. And he's making sure that they don't get that money. This is this is as clear as it can possibly be, Jason. The question is just, is anyone going to do anything about it? Uh, it, it, that's always a question when it comes to these type of policies that 45 wants to wants to imbue on the American society, right? And have you, I mean, I was in a post office in Los Angeles two weeks ago and in here in Miami, and there's a maudlin energy when you walk into these places because the employees are taxed, right? There's one person working there, yeah. they're doing the best they can. They are under severe stress, not only because we're in the middle of a pandemic, but these people are trying to hold on to their jobs at a place that's severely underfunded and they don't know what's gonna happen next. It's the post office and receiving your mail, John, is as American as baseball, football, and anything that we enjoy here as American citizens. So for Trump to come out and say, hey, I'm going to take away something that could possibly help these people. As you said, it's clear as day what the conspiracy that people have been saying about border suppression is and that is that they, they it, it, it exists and this is just another way or or not so much a covert way mm-hmm. of enacting that right it's it's I mean read between the lines if if you will then if if he's not coming out and saying this is what I'm gonna do to have a negative effect on the post office then read between the lines and realize that that's what he is exactly saying and some people are denying that but he is yeah. saying that I'm going to do what I can to win this election in 2020 by doing whatever I can to win this election in 2020. Yeah, and the thing is, like the way that I think Jenk uh, he tweeted to this effect in the morning. He's like, "What you're supposed to do, you big idiot, is to pretend there's some other reason. Come up with right. some excuse for why you have to cut the funding, but actually behind the scenes be doing it to stop people mm-hmm. from voting." But he just bumbles into, "No, that's why I'm doing it." But the thing is, is that like we don't get to point the finger and ha ha him if nothing happens when he does that. If he still gets to cut the funding, if the votes still don't happen, then the joke is indeed on us. And right. so that's why I'm waiting to see what's actually gonna happen. Because at this point, we now have sort of similar. So in 2016, we knew months out that there was stuff going on, the intent of which was to try to influence the election. For a variety of reasons, not everybody could get behind thinking that that was necessarily an issue. Whether you think it was or not, fine. Now. No one should be able to say that this isn't an issue, that we're not allowed to or shouldn't, or that we're hysterical if we think that trying to cut funding to stop people from voting by mail during a horrific pandemic that is as bad today as effectively it's been since the beginning is not a bad thing. We can all get together, this isn't 2016 anymore. Anyone who doesn't fight on this issue, I have no idea what is motivating them politically, what their objectives are. Because it certainly isn't winning elections. Right. Um, and, and, you know, and John, and John, there will be some people who will who will say that that is not what the president's doing. His base will say, nope, this this makes perfect sense. This is the right policy, and it's and then we'll and we'll try to justify to at any length why this is good. But I agree with you one hundred percent. Your question is though, how do we fight this? And 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 that in itself is beyond me because it seems like the more the more we try to galvanize and mobilize and fight and fight these injustices the bigger they become and the harder it begins the harder it gets excuse me to fight these things so i don't know how we fight this really i don't but what doing what we're doing here now speaking out about it, i think that's the best course of action as we as american people have yeah. to fight this don't you think yeah i mean 
there's just so many of the mechanisms that like four years ago, I would have said, "Oh, well, you should do this. Oh, no, wait, that doesn't work. Oh, he can he can say it and he doesn't get, it doesn't hurt him pressure wise. His base doesn't actually, they, they, want, they don't want people to vote. So it being revealed isn't gonna hurt him with his base. And well, you can't even impeach him because no matter how obvious the crimes are, he's not actually gonna get removed because the Senate doesn't care because they also don't want people to vote. So there's just a lot of these provisions that aren't really provisions anymore. They're sort of like these right. interesting, Relics of the democracy we thought we had, and it turns out that a lot of it was, you know, it was it was only as effective as the emperor's clothes. Um, right. Yeah. So it's it's a big problem. Certainly got to talk about it. Uh, and also one one thing that. I, I hope helps to make it get through to people is that it isn't just Trump. That should be enough. But take a look at Larry Kudlow talking about um, the issues with the stimulus funding negotiations that are ongoing. So much of the uh, Democratic uh, asks are really liberal left wish lists. We don't we don't want to have vote you know voting rights and aid mm -hmm. to uh, aliens mm -hmm. and so forth. That's not our game, and President can't accept that okay. kind of deal. Yeah, so uh, voting rights aren't our game. Well, that's honest. You got to give them points for honesty. Right, right. I know. <laughs> Speaking on this whole this whole stimulus, I know we're not. I know we're talking about the postal service, but it's all just one dumpster fire to me, John. Nice. Um, what what's so frustrating about about them renegotiating and trying to get more money out to people is that they. I feel like they don't realize how bad people need aid right now. They, they, I, I don't understand what world we're living in where these people on the Hill and in Congress or whoever's making these decisions aren't listening and seeing that they're that in some states. Okay, look, California has has amazing unemployment, if you will, for what it is. Right, it it, it pays probably one of the most out of this out of this out of the union, mm -hmm. and. Taking that additional 600 or taking away additional funding, there's people who can't even afford to pay to pay to pay their rent now or to feed their kids. And then you have this pandemic, this this other layer of that that you have to somewhat qualify for that you may not qualify for when your when your benefits run out. So it's I I, I really think that people just don't care, or the people that are making the decisions on the Republican Party just don't care about the well-being of the American people, but claim to to say that. And I'm glad this guy was honest. It was like, listen, voter rights, sure, I guess that's our thing, but whatever. I would rather honesty than 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 a lie or to or to, I don't know, trick us into thinking that you have our, our well being and our best interest at heart when in fact you don't. Yeah. Yeah. And and you know I'm glad when they come out with videos like that, like like you said, that are very honest because I continually try to remind people that there is an ongoing war for what system of government we're going to have. Are we actually going to have a democracy in this country? And it isn't sexy to talk about it, and so generally it doesn't get talked about. But you have the Republican Party that has been attempting in ways that are explicit, some that are a little bit harder to see, to chip away at, at those rights, which were never all that never all that solid to begin with for literally decades. And you have the Democratic Party that's like kind of resisting the backslide in some ways and then not using the opportunities they have. Like when we had basically unified government for a short period under Obama, some of the things that could have been done to make our elections significantly more solid and secure and accessible to working Americans weren't done. Yeah. Um, and we need to put pressure on the Democratic Party to be as vigorous in their defense of our democratic rights as the Republican Party is in their offense against those. Oh, 100%. But, um, I couldn't agree more. It's it's go it's a go hard it's a beyond a go hard or go home situation. We're playing we're we're praying for this hell Mary that will happen with Biden and Kamala, right? We're praying that this will be something that's beautiful and will change. And it's it's almost as if we're desperate for this to happen. But I do think along the way, you mentioned great word vigorous. We we need to be is just as vigorous as our as our enemy. I'm gonna call it, call it what it is as our enemy. As they are trying to end what we're trying to do and what we're trying to conquer and what we're trying to achieve, and I just, what swift kick in the ass is going to make that happen? Though, I, right? I don't it, know. It, it's exhausting. I mean, to even think about it. Like I, I thought that same thing about some other issues, like about you know prioritizing climate change, and, and sometimes the right politician making it core to their messaging, like like AOC and some others. Maybe maybe that could do it. You know. Maybe if one of these politicians comes in and just really starts focusing on this, um, maybe that could be something. I, I don't know, honestly. Yeah. I have I have more like requests than answers these days, unfortunately. Right. 
Same. But um, let's talk a little bit more about the post office. Uh, we know Donald Trump wants to stop the post office from functioning the way it's supposed to, to damage your ability to um, vote during the election. But let's talk about some of the ways that that's happening. So in a Wednesday evening press conference, he said he wouldn't sign off on either a $25 billion in emergency funds for the USPS or a $3.5 billion grant to help the post office's processing of election mail that Democrats are currently advocating for as part of the next federal COVID-19 relief bill. So we know that it's an absolute disaster at the post office right now. Not let's wait and see in 60 days it's happening right now. We got a super chat from this thing on the left who said, my dad is a carrier works in Oakland. He's been there 30 years. He told me yep. he has never seen it this bad. Mail mm-hmm. piling up over time being limited. That second left's dad is experiencing what the goal of this is. And so extra money to try to stop that from continuing, Trump isn't gonna sign it. And that's a consistent position that he's had. So he um, he opposes any measure to help the post office. He refused to sign the CARES Act if it included a bailout for the agency. That was back in April. So mm-hmm. like, you know what he's been bragging about the fact that he passed it and he pushed for it. He set a requirement, mm-hmm. there will be no coronavirus aid. That was the, the only thing the government has really done was the CARES Act. He was gonna veto it if it included aid for the, the post office. You can't be any more opposed to the functioning of a, of, a, of a government agency than that, that you would resign people to die from a pandemic at higher rates to make your point. Right, the acrimony that Donald J. Trump expresses consistently on, I would say, a weekly basis about the post office is just unconscionable, right? I don't understand for someone who has, who says that he's for the people that, that this is make America great again. Let's just go there, make America great again. One of the things, as I said earlier, that is, that is hyper American is the postal service. Mm -hmm. And you, John, you can walk into any post office now. And see piles upon piles of just boxes and mail in the front. Last week, as I said, I was at one here in Miami, and I could look beyond, look behind the counter and see a mound of unsorted mail. And the woman said, That's all mail from this week that hasn't gone out yet. Yeah. So it's 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 the disservice that's happening not only to the American people but the people who work well they are American people the people who work at the post service is it's tragic it's tragic and for what though for what yes we know that okay voter suppression is on the table right now in regards to these ballots right but prior to that what's his issue with the postal service remind me because I I don't I I for the life of me I can't even remember why is he so pissed at the USPS. Well, I mean, part of it, of course, is that for a long time they've wanted to replace it. They wanted to privatize it effectively and hand over those responsibilities to private companies so that they can profit. And it doesn't matter if that makes the service worse or more expensive. That's what they want to do. And and as a, a demonstration of this, perhaps, I'm going to jump ahead to the last graphic here and then maybe resume, Skip. Um, the head of the US Postal Service still has at least $30 million invested in a contractor. And so effectively has. A, a financial interest um, opposed to the fundamental mission of the agency, which is again what we've seen with effectively every aspect of government mm-hmm. since the beginning. The EPA is advocating for fossil fuels, you know, and, and all of that. But there is definitely a, there's a profit motive uh, at play here. And um, you know, I, I'm going to go back one one graphic because I want to read this. So the head of the the Iowa Postal Workers Union alleged Tuesday that mail sorting machines are being removed from post offices in her state due to new policies imposed by Postmaster General Louis DeJoy, a major GOP donor to President Trump, um, who has been responsible for basically overseeing this war against the post office. So as a direct and almost immediate result of DeJoy's policies. You have um, these machines being pulled out, so they don't have the processing speed. That's the that's mm-hmm. the goal. Um, right. A reprioritizing of what sort of mail needs to go out first. So in some cases, saying you have to send out the junk mail before you can get to the priority mail and things like that, because mm-hmm. again, they don't want mm-hmm. it to work. And right. just a few days ago, there was effectively like um, I forget the the historical analogy I'm going for here, but fired a ton of the post office's higher ups all in one fell swoop. Effectively taking out a gigantic portion of their institutional knowledge just months before the election. And at a time when, when you're not gonna have the funding and you don't have the equipment, you could at least use people who know how this thing is supposed to run. Well, they just mm-hmm. cleared out all those people too. So like we were saying before, I don't know if we can do literally anything about this. It feels like we're just watching our democracy being shredded and we're powerless powerless to stop it. 
But the very least, I'm going to provide a historical log of this happening. Right, and, and and we are forever and eternally grateful for you for that, John. This is like a bad episode of The Handmaid's Tale, where these mm-hmm. people just come in and just eradicate the, the government, dismantle what we've known to be working that's been effective for people, then usher in a new way of horror and terror to to go forward for some for some for their own personal gain. So listen, all we have right now is what we can do is talk about it, and and hopefully when November rolls around, we'll see change with a new administration. I mean, that's where we're yeah. at. Yeah. Exactly, and and look, my my fear about the the next four years, if that does happen, is that there won't be enough of the change that I want in the direction I want. But I don't have to worry about Biden trying to destroy the post office so that our elections don't count for anything. Like at least that's one thing. That'll be nice. Right. Hey, that that's worth something. That sells for something. It is. It is. We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media, and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un the Republic, or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be, featuring in-depth research, razor sharp commentary and just the right amount of vulgarity the unftr podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows but don't just take my word for it the new york times described unftr as consistently compelling and educational aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school for as the great philosopher yoda once put it you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. Donald Trump is testing out a new narrative, I guess, for talking about the the current COVID-19 pandemic and his press conferences, Uh, here he is. But the virus continues to increase in nations across the globe. Last week, France and Germany both recorded their highest daily number of new cases in three months. Not that I wanna bring that up, but might as well explain it to the media. The seven-day case average for Germany has increased by 62% since last week, unfortunately, and that is truly unfortunate. It's increased 82% in France, 113% in Spain, and 30% in the United Kingdom. Those are big uh, increases. Cases are also rapidly increasing in the Netherlands, Sweden, Belgium, Switzerland, Slovakia, Estonia, and other European countries. And in our country, they're going down. They're going down. No, yeah, people right. are going down, unfortunately, in mass numbers. Uh, more than a thousand a day for a number of days, people have been going down. Um, really fast, before we get into the actual numbers, because you'll be shocked to find out that what he was saying there was highly dishonest. Um, I'm going to do the first of two instances on today's show where I am going to annoy the entire audience and probably Jason as well by giving myself credit for a prediction that worked out. So well, not really a prediction so much, but I wanna show you what I said on the show back on August 4th. So his strategy of, okay, sure it's bad here, but focus on the fact that I'm telling you it's bad elsewhere. Elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Take a look at what I was saying on August 4th. So we often say that we have done worse than other countries, which when I say it, I can't speak for everyone, is supposed to, light a fire under people to want our government to do better. Okay, that's what it means. What it doesn't mean is if we were doing exactly what we're doing right now, but other countries were doing worse, that I'd be satisfied. But all of what he just said implies, I just need to trick you into thinking that other people have it worse and then what we've got will be okay. So that's what he's doing. He's talking about these percentage spikes in Slovakia and Estonia to make you less horrified by the fact that um, yesterday, 
1,503 deaths were reported in the United States in just one day. The highest number in three months, deaths, not a percentage mm -hmm. increase in cases. The worst possible outcome of the coronavirus is killing someone and we're killing people at the highest rate that we have in three months. Right, listen, going back to March and April when this virus first descended upon humanity, it felt like it the, the darkest days of COVID was for me at least, I'm sure a lot of other people was March 17th, quarantine Los Angeles and across the country through April, which is a blur. We didn't give a damn about what was happening overseas. We cared about what was happening outside our front door, mm -hmm. right? So you, you, so him, thank you, Trump. Thank you so much for that wonderful information about Estonia and Transylvania and wherever that has, that has these numbers, that's great. But right now in our communities, Right now, when the places that we walk through the world outside of our doors, our jobs, the, the places that we go daily, we care about those numbers here. I'm in Florida, which is of course a hot spot, a hot spot. Mm -hmm. And there are people still not wearing masks. Yeah. They're, they're not, they're, they're, they're just, I'm not doing it, I'm not doing it. And so for him to not, again, just keep it here. We, 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 we want, we need comprehensive and I think we talked about this last time I was on the damage report with you John. It's just we need to, we want to be able to be okay because it's been too long we've been quarantined. It's been too yeah. long we've been in distress. It's been too long that our mental health has suffered. It's been too long that financially we've suffered. It's been too long that people are going without. It's it's too long. Take care of the people here. Wish wishing everyone else uh, wishing everyone else abroad speedy recovery safety as well. Absolutely. But the American people need just as bad, Trump. So figure that yeah. out. It's it's that it's that what aboutism, right? That that's is that an, is this is this another another instance yeah. of that, John? Yeah, it's it's what aboutism, but like kind of even more dishonest than what aboutism tends to be. And so let, let's mm -hmm. let's explain how. So you saw the video. His you know Lithuania went up by thirty percent, and Estonia went up by the single greatest increase. Okay, well let's talk about their actual numbers. How about that? Percentages are fun. I love percentages. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about actual numbers on the ground. So France did go up, okay? Uh, they went up to 2,000 cases a day. Okay, that's bad for France, that is. It right. is one, like 25th what we have, something like that. Slovakia spiked, he said that. Do you know what the spike was? What 63 was cases. Okay. In the country, that was the single highest day in the spike that he's referencing. Estonia spiked to 22 cases. You know how many deaths they've had? 63, not on that day, ever, right, ever, 63. Yeah. Switzerland has had less than 200 cases a day. That's the spike he's talking about. Germany isn't spiking, it still has 1,000 or less cases per day. And on the day when I initially prepared this story, let's talk about those, those final most important, most gruesome numbers. So we had 1,503 deaths in the last day of reporting. All those countries he listed, how many deaths did they have on that same day? France, zero. United Kingdom, zero. Canada, four. Germany, six. Italy, six. And meanwhile, we again have over 1,500, the most that we've had in about three months. So look, you can have fun with numbers. I love having fun with numbers, but unfortunately these numbers aren't all that fun when you actually dig down and see what the reality is. Right, and the reality is is that not enough is being done here to protect our people. And, and look, and it doesn't, we have, John, I said this, I'll, I'll say it again when we talked about this last time. We, I think that we're at a, at a point now Obviously, where we've been here, where we have to take ownership of our health, right? We because no one else is going to do it for us, of course. And when you, you know, what I, I would like to see a spike and something go up is the effort that hopefully the government's putting into finding a vaccine and creating a vaccine and a cure for this, mm -hmm. because that, that's that's that should be in the next, of course, appropriate action, the next appropriate step. But until that happens, we have to take ownership and own our health and own our safety, yeah. because obviously the people that we've elected to look out for us in, in a myriad of different ways. Now we've talked about saving jobs, we've talked about livelihoods, our saving our health isn't doing that. They're not doing that. And again, I stand by that I care about what's happening outside my front door. I care about the safety yeah. of my loved ones outside my front door and the people I care about, the, my friends, the family I choose. I care about their safety outside my front door. So yeah. that's what I hope that our president can get back to. It's, he's, he, it's not gonna happen in the, in the next 100 days. He's checked out. 
right? He's checked out. It's just, it's yeah. like he's pivoted. He's pivoted to I need to get reelected. So what 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 can I do or what can I say or how can I look the best in order to have that to have that be come to fruition? That's what yeah, I'm getting from. You're 100 percent right. No, he's he's checked out, and so until. You know, basically till the end of the pandemic, because even right. even if he loses on November, he's still going to be in charge for for months after that. Um, right. Yeah, no, we. It sucks to say it, we chose wrong in 2016, and we will now continue to pay the price, and the price is terrible. Uh, I've in my family, we've paid that price. I'm sure everyone watching this knows somebody who has paid that price because yeah. as a country, we chose wrong. We went in the wrong direction, right. and he's never going to get better, and he's never going to care whether we live or die. Um, and so that's what we've got. And so 1500 people died in the last day of reporting. By the time this pandemic is done, maybe 50,000 more, 100,000, 500,000, I don't know. But that's now baked in. He's never going to improve. It doesn't matter how bad it looks. It doesn't matter how bad it gets. He isn't going to improve. Yep. Rudy Giuliani, lawyer to the president, was asked recently, what if Biden someday was to investigate Trump after becoming president? Take a look what he had to say. Uh, Mayor, how unprecedented and how damaging would it be for a Biden administration to criminally prosecute a former president? Well, we would become a banana republic, uh, Governor. Yeah, so um, so <laughs> coming from the party of the locker up, locker mm -hmm. up, Obama gate. It's the biggest thing in the world, right. the biggest scandal, lock Obama, investigate Obama. We. Wait, Biden might be president? No, 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 hands off, don't touch our man. That would be, I mean, come on, think about the precedent. Banana Republic stuff, you know, as they're eating bananas. Arr, we don't want a banana Republic. Arr, arr. <laughs> yeah, um, so look, I, I agree. I think that Biden is both unlikely to investigate Trump and I don't think anything would come of it. Trump is never gonna have a consequence for anything he's done in his life. That's baked on in for the next, you know, whatever remaining years he has in his life, two or four or whatever. He's never gonna get any consequences, and I've come to accept that. What do you think? Well, it's you know, the whole pettiness of the 2016 investigations with Hillary and what it's petty, right? It's they're, they're flying high in their petty copters, and I feel I, I would like to think that when <laughs> they go low, we go high. So I agree with you. I don't think I don't think Biden is even remotely interested in investigating Trump because again, what is it, what is that going to do? But if Biden and Kamala are smart when they win, I'm manifesting that when they win, they're going to focus on on trying to fix what's been tragically just to our detriment the last four years. And I, and I think mm -hmm. that's I think that's what needs to happen. You know, the past is the past. We've tried to hold people accountable. We've tried to to have smear have headlines that have held people accountable, and it hasn't happened yet. We have to just take our losses, which sucks. This whole the, John, the last four years has been a very clear and very hard to swallow exercise in letting I was gonna say the S word, letting stuff go. Really, <laughs> seriously, we've, that was we, close. We, right? We've, we've had to let we've had to just accept that the surrender. Yeah, it's surrender to what has happened. It's be like, okay, look, fine. Mm -hmm. We'll take what we have and hope for the future. Yeah, because that, 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 that's the only comfort we've been able to ascertain and acquire and get throughout all of this. So I don't think Biden's investigating anyone. Yeah, I don't think so. I think that they're gonna say that, you know, and and Kamala sort of hinted at it. Um, they'll they'll hint at it, but no, I, I don't I don't think that they're likely to actually do it and. Yeah, and and that's fine. The thing is, I, I am at least going to again. We we have um sort of it's in our mission statement for TDR every day. We have to pointlessly point out hypocrisy, even though hypocrisy mm -hmm. doesn't matter anymore. So uh, bear in mind, Giuliani urged Trump to criminally investigate Biden earlier this year over unfounded corruption accusations about Biden's part in the ouster of a Ukrainian prosecutor. He's also since personally pushed for an investigation in Trump's baseless Obamagate conspiracy theory. So when it's Biden or Obama. Giuliani thinks, investigate them, lock them up. When it's Trump, he doesn't. Um, however, sort of to his limited credit, he, at least in the research I've done, has never really been one for the lock her up, the, the Hillary Clinton. Back in 2016, he was asked about it and he said, I think it's a tough decision. I think it's a tough one that should be given a lot of thought and shouldn't be an off the cuff answer. Equal administration of justice is one of our most important principles. I told you, I think it's a very close question. So he's not necessarily against it, but he wasn't chanting lock him up. 
he was chanting other stuff, I guess. But so that's well, because, to because his credit. To some somewhat to his credit, thank you for that. Because I think underneath that horrible accent and those terrible glasses and just everything that irritates me about him, there's probably a shred of human decency that's lingering there somewhere, John. It's yeah. it's 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 there. And as a lawyer, as someone who who abide is is taught to abide by the law and what the law says. He's saying that people deserve just they deserve prop the do do justice do due process of the law, right? Mm-hmm. So for him to have that that moral that moment of just moral goodness is 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 nice, is a somewhat of a redeeming quality for 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 um, Giuliani. And also, he's telling he's saying lock up two people two from marginalized groups of people. Yes, Hillary Clinton was a privileged white woman, but she was also a woman, and of course Obama was a black man. So, um, you know, whereas whereas Trump is what is is a white a privileged white man, right? So there's there's that. I'm sure people will disagree with me, but I think there is, of course, microaggressions. There's unconscious biases when it comes to all these things that people are saying when about Kamala, especially about Kamala now, especially mm-hmm. about Kamala. Some of the stuff I've been reading is just like, wow, the minute a black woman gets is is thrust into the forefront to be a political leader. More the ugliness that comes out is just unreal, unreal. You but want, I, you want back, a bit? You want a bit of that? Go for it. Hit, hit me with it. Play, hit me with it, John. Let's just, we, we're gonna have a lot more, but let's play just the the next bit of Giuliani's comments. Here is what he had to say when he transitioned to Kamala Harris. Biden has uh, nothing left. She's a very mean woman, and she was a terrible prosecutor. He said she's a very mean person. Nobody likes her. So look, I obviously I have I have issues on policy with Kamala Harris, but like nobody likes her. She's mean. She's very mean. And we're gonna we're gonna have more on Trump on that later. But yeah, I think it's funny that like that's the best he has is she's mean. Right. She's mean. She's she's an A B she's an A B W, an angry black woman. That's what he wanted mm-hmm. to say. I know I spoke to Omarosa Manigault Newman earlier this week, who of course wrote unhinged an account to what to her being a senior advisor for the Trump administration. And one of the things that she pointed out that really resonated with me and I true and I find to be true is that a woman of color, the first the first dagger they're gonna hurl at a woman of color who stands her ground, who has strong opinions, and who isn't afraid to to stand up to her non-PLC counterparts, be it male or female, is that she's angry, that they're she's very mean. Very, mm-hmm. very mean. But yet Trump has gone on and called Women dogs has has done so many things that are openly mean, but Giuliani would never say he's a mean man. He's no, just he's no. doing what's, he's doing what's right for the American people. But uh, and I look, I'm sure people in the comments are like, why is Jason bringing race into this? Because in 2020, race is always brought into things mm-hmm. because it's it's it matters. Clearly, yeah. we've seen that race is a thing. It's always been a thing, but now more than ever. It's absolutely a thing. So Giuliani, I don't know. I think there's some unconscious bias there and there's some microaggressions going on. Who knows? I wouldn't put it past him, but good for him for having some moral high ground. Yeah, no, Jason isn't bringing race into it. Race is in it. Jason's acknowledging it. (laughs) Yesterday, Donald Trump provided his first attacks against a new VP pick, Kamala Harris. And I noticed at the time that something was missing. And so I acknowledged it on yesterday's show. Take a look at what I said then. Biden's VP pick and Donald Trump immediately hit her um, on substance, calling her nasty. (laughs) Well, she is a woman, so I get what he means in his in Trump speak. Um, I'm assuming she will become angry at some point. She's not angry yet, but for Trump, she's gonna be angry soon. I I guarantee that. So that's his immediate reaction. So uh, that guarantee did not take long to pay dividends, I guess. Let's go to Trump talking about Kamala Harris since that cliff. And now you have a, a sort of a mad woman, I, I call her, because she was so angry and so, such hatred with Justice Kavanaugh. I mean, I've never seen anything like it. She was the angriest of the group, and they were all angry. They were all radical left angry people. And they're angry because I beat them. Yeah. <laughs> they still haven't forgotten. You know, these are seriously ill people. But yeah, just uh, said she's angry over and no. over and over and over again. And they're seriously ill people. Okay, um, 
The well, look, I will give this to Trump. He did say the same about Megyn Kelly. Okay, so I mean, at least he's consistent. <laughs> I mean, he said that she had that she was ang- anger menstruating or something like that. So at least he's consistent with using anger for against women. But I, John, I'm telling you, the God, what there, Shikamala's not angry. I, okay, if you're not angry in 2020, then there's something wrong with you. Mm-hmm. Especially, especially people that are that are working in politics. Especially people that are very close to to trying to wanting to change policy. Especially people who are on on the on the on boots on the ground. On, the, on you know, what's the word I'm looking for? They're on they're on the front lines. I'm sorry, trying to enact change. Of course, you're yeah. going to be angry. You know, yeah. so. I mean, it, it could be it could be anyone. Hell, I'm angry. You're angry. Our our producers are angry. People are all are angry. So it's like, come on now, come on. You know. Yeah. So I, I I really think it if because she's black. That's all it is. And, he's, and people. He's, no, continue, continue. And, well, no, it's because you know. Being a, being, I'm an LGBTQ man of color, and I, you know, to some people, there's two strikes against me already for for those having those be part of my existence in the world, and I think people get mad when when you bring up race and when you say, oh, you that, that you're playing the race card, but it's it's I, now more than ever, it's such an issue for people. We've seen it. Hello, with George Floyd, we, it's it's we can't deny that race is a major major element when it comes to how we interact with people, how we see people, how we mm-hmm. how we how we attach to their stories or detach from their stories. And for Kamala, I think it's absolutely an underlying thing for people that she's a black female that that will potentially be in power. And that doesn't sit well with people who don't want to see that happen, mainly Trump and and his base. Yeah, and and the thing is, like with Trump, like it's not going to be subtle at all. He's literally just like the if if the trope is angry black woman, he's just going to say she's angry, she's angry, she's angry, she's angry. Right. There's not going to be any glossing over or anything like that. And so we get to point it out. Um, doesn't mean. Uh, just in case Tucker Carlson's watching, that doesn't mean you can't criticize her when we point out that some of the criticism is racist. Yes, you can still have a problem with her prosecutorial background, the fact that she's probably not gonna push for Medicare for all, all the policy stuff that we've talked about, you could criticize her for. But the thing is, Trump's not gonna do that because what is he gonna say? She was like too tough on crime. He wants to present himself as doing that. He wants to pretend that she wants to defund the police, so he can't actually Criticize her for what she really did in that area. What is he going to say? Like that she's not going to pass Medicare for all? No, he doesn't want to pass it either. So the the policy stuff is going to be very difficult for him to hit her on, especially because they've decided no, we're not going to point out the things in her past that progressives had an issue with. We're going to call them both radical far leftists. Mm -hmm. So they have to pretend that none of the stuff she could legitimately be criticized for, they can't acknowledge that stuff because it undercuts the narrative that she's a far left Maoist radical. So Mm -hmm. we can have issues on actual policy on substance, but they're going to, they have that narrative. And the only other things that are consistent with that, that they think they can get away with are misogyny and racism effectively. Right, And, and much like, Bad people on all sides, on all sides, or or having his base be the ones to call her an angry black man, and he won't, and he'll co-sign that. Yep. See, look, every, every, everyone sees it. Everyone sees it. This is what she is because his base. He's he's uh, indirectly engaging his base to see her as that, and then allowing them to call her that and say, "I'm not saying that they are, but hey, was I wrong?" You know, it's it's it goes. It's just passing the buck and not taking accountability. Mm-hmm. I look. I would I would respect him more, honestly, John, if he would come out and 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 not to make this whole conversation about her being an angry black woman because that's not the that's not the narrative we're pushing here at TYT at all. But I would respect him more if he would come out and call her that, and mm-hmm. have the balls and be like, "That's how I truly feel about her." Mm-hmm. That I would be like, okay, well, look, look, at least he's being honest and we know where he stands. There that that stand that stands for something somewhere. Yeah. But to not, but to not have the, I don't want to say the balls, but not to have the 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 courage to do that just just pisses me off even more. Mm-hmm. To not have the filet fishes to say what he really thinks. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> filet fishes. <sighs> well, he likes those. 
Donald Trump hasn't often tried to pick a fight with AOC because he knows what happens to people when they pick fights with AOC. But he did talk a bit about her, and I think after today he's going to regret it. Here he is uh, talking about AOC. He is going to give not tax increases, massive tax increases to pay for uh, AOC's plan. AOC was a poor student. Uh, at, uh, I mean, I, I won't say where she went to school, it doesn't matter. This is not even a smart person, other than she's got a good line of stuff. I mean, she goes out and she, she uh, yaps. These guys, and they're all afraid of her. Because if you notice, all of these progressives are beating the regular Democrats, you know. You okay, I left that last part in because I like it. Um, but anyway, yeah, she's a poor student. I won't say what school she went to because it doesn't matter. Really, it's because he doesn't know. Um, and she just goes out and yaps. That's how he talks about a congresswoman, a poor student who yaps. Um, look, nothing, nothing that he has said about AOC in the past ever has any weight or any merit. She's a badass, point blank period. She's young, she's millennial, she's connected. She is, and I know we're gonna talk about AOC a little bit more, but. What's so beautiful about this woman is that she's fearless. She, she's mm -hmm. this fearless chick that 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 is able to connect with the generation that's very important, right? Millennials, Gen Z, young millennials see her as someone who is much like them, and that's and that's the beauty of of how we exist now. We want to see people, much like on television, we want to see people that yeah. look like us because it's relatable, right? When you reveal and you're relatable, you you're able to to have people really ride hard for you, really go hard for you, really have loyalty, a sense of loyalty. And this younger generation, much like Rock the Vote back in mm -hmm. the 90s and early 2000s, when, which was really progressive for that time, which was awesome. But we were the future and now we're setting it up for the future, right? And AOC is that perfect person to really get the, the, the again, Gen Z's, millennials, young millennials, to show up at the polls to vote and have their voice heard, and that and that requ and that requires someone who was smart and who was savvy. So, what it looks again? Why are we listening to what Trump says? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Which I haven't, are we insane? Are we doing the same thing over and over again, expecting <laughs> a different result? Is that is that, uh, is that what to, yeah, to do? Do it feels like yeah, every day. I think I think that's what's <laughs> happening. I wake up at six every day and it's the same thing. Um, but anyway, um, I, I get what you're saying. I do want to help out the president when I can. So it was obvious from that video that he doesn't actually know uh, where she went to school or how she did. So let's just fill it in. Um, it was easy to find out that she graduated cum laude from Boston University in 2011 with a Bachelor of Arts degree in both international relations and economics. How good of a school is BU? I don't really know. I'll say that way a long time ago they waitlisted me and then passed on me. So I, too good for me, I guess. Um, but anyway, she got the degrees and she did the work. She didn't pay other right. people to take the SATs for and stuff like that. So anyway, um, he he says that she just goes out and yaps. And honestly, I'm here for it. So here she is yapping on Twitter, saying, "Let's make a deal, Mr. President. You release your college transcript, I'll release mine, and we'll see who is the better student." Loser has to fund the post office. Clap back. I mean, so okay, can we, John? This is the perfect example of why also she is such a killer individual. She's 31 this October, Libra, love it. 31. Using Easy. It's a baby, but knows how to, again, engage these people and to have these moments that people are going to see that are very powerful. Social, we can't, we cannot deny that social media has permeated every fabric of humanity. Social media is the, the barometer, the base, the foundation of how we communicate now more than ever, it seems like, right? So for her to yeah. be, to her to engage a president cleverly like that, is is indicative of how woke and amazing this woman is because you don't see I don't I don't see what John Bolton in his book I don't see him going on Twitter clapping back at people you know <laughs> as cleverly as AOC really no. you know it matters it ma she she knows what's up and that's important so <laughs> and just aside just a little a little tidbit I also got to hang out with AOC on the set of RuPaul's Drag Race and she's an oh. incredible person. And she and she is just so she she comes home after fighting the good fight and, and being a punching bag for all these right wing lames, kicks off her Louboutin and says, I'm gonna watch RuPaul's Drag Race. <laughs> That's my type of girl. That's my type of girl. I didn't get to hang out with AOC on the set of RuPaul's Drag Race. 
I talked to Peppermint a couple days ago. That's the closest I came, but um, no, that's awesome, man. Why don't, can I shadow you? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, I keep missing out. But anyway, yeah. I, I love her, I love her response. He's definitely not gonna do it. Like he, and remember, he's he's an alpha male. He's the strong man. He's a tough guy. He's a tough guy. Republican. Is he gonna like be challenged and then just like shy away? Yes, he will. Best yes, case scenario, he, he releases a doctored transcript himself. But of course, she did better than him. Of course, she did. And he is just he is gonna tuck tail. Right between the old filet fishes, and he's just mm -hmm. not going to say anything. Okay, <laughs> he's not going to say nothing. Um, good job, AOC, uh, on that. Next week we have the Democratic Convention, which means we have the speeches. I'm going to be doing um, live commentary on the first day with Jank Uger on the the Young Turks. So we're going to be doing commentary throughout. And on that first day, I was very excited to find out that one of the speakers was going to be Representative Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. I was very excited. Turns out I should have dialed down the excitement a bit because she's speaking sort of a little. She's gonna have one minute to speak at the DNC next week, according to new reporting. The DNC will air a 60 second pre recorded message filmed by her at home. And when I saw that, I wish that I could take the DNC and put it in a little rocket and fire it into a neutron star. What is wrong with you people? Mm -hmm. She should be giving the keynote address at the DNC. You're giving her one minute and it's not even live. An ad basically that she's gonna film. Why not even just, why not have her, why not have her at all? It's such an insult to like what theoretically could be the future of your party that is coming into the party because of people like AOC to spit in their face this way, Jesus. It's, it, it absolutely is terrible. Um, the, look, those the RNC and the DNC are much like the Golden Globes and the SAG Awards. You know, they they got to get in and out. There's there's a there's a schedule. There is I I'm not sure if there is if there is commercials that are played. I can't remember. Is there, is there commercials played during when they go to break and they go to I, and from in break the convention? Time? I think so. Okay, great. I'm not so sure. I'm so they. I'm sure there's producers that are, there's a whole list of things, but the slight that has happened at the expense of AOC, I would agree with you. She, again, going back to what we said earlier, there, to me at least for, for, Myself, there isn't one person in the party that is as compelling or as engaging or as just interesting and and just wonderful as AOC. You want to bring out your stars. If you want to, if you want to approach this from a showbiz aspect, you bring out the stars, right? You bring out the people that that people like, that people want to see. And I understand because of COVID and the pandemic, things are, things are pre-recorded. I mean, that's been the new normal now with every award show and things of this nature that are broadcast and that are huge. But you you pulled all the stops, and she is someone. She's a heavy hitter. She's yeah. not some clandestine person that was just like, oh, oh, yeah, you had a hot moment back in January. Okay, yeah, sure, you can talk. She's a yeah. mainstay, and 60 seconds goes by quickly. That means that she has to highly edit and completely just truncate what she wants to say in order to get it out there. And it's yeah. a huge disservice. Maybe, and I, they need to rethink that, which I don't think they will. But knowing AOC, she's going to hit it out of the park in the little time that she has. But still, it's a it's a grave misstep. Whoever made the decision, so. producers needs to needs to be fired. <laughs> yeah, it's Point you know, through. I mean, and the thing is, like, I I say it's stupid. It's obviously not stupid from their perspective. They don't want people like AOC to become the party. It's stupid. Right. It's literally the best possible future for the Democratic Party is if they start to act and talk and think more like AOC and Ilhan and Rashida and Corey and Ayana and, and all those others. Um, so that's obviously disappointing. One minute, one minute. Anyway, as, as many people have acknowledged in the chat, thank you. Um, she greeted this news in her characteristic fashion, uh, tweeting a poem by Dr. Benjamin Mays, uh, recited by Elijah Cummings. I only have a minute, 60 seconds in it, forced upon me, I did not choose it. But I know that I must use it, give account if I abuse it, suffer if I lose it. Only a tiny little minute, but eternity is in it. Uh, what, John, okay, first of all, stop. I mean, who is this woman? Who is this vision? <laughs> who is this 
how, like going back to what I said about her being so witty and speaking the language of, of the, young, the younger generation. And only she would so effortlessly and eloquently and poetically tweet that, that it's yeah. so fitting. So I fitting. agree. Uh, I like agree. How, uh, a freaking superstar, and I hate to to bring her down to a superstar because I'm sure there's other yeah. amazing names to, to monikers to attach to her. But I mean, yeah, it's 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 sad, but she will she will kill it in that one minute. I agree. Yeah, you know what? She can play Storm. Anyway, um, yeah, and and the thing is, like, she's gonna have that one minute. It's unclear if any other speakers are subject to the same time limits, and the DNC didn't respond to a request for comment. So you know what? Um, there's a bunch of you out there, Dragon Squad's assembled. Uh, why, why don't you start tweeting and calling DNC? Let them know what you think yeah. about them giving her just a minute. Is that showing respect for the progressives they're gonna need to win this election? I kind of think not. Now, uh, there are other speakers as well, uh, Michelle Obama, Chuck Schumer, uh, Pete Buttigieg. He'll mm -hmm. be giving a live speech, by the mm -hmm. way, and I have a feeling it probably won't be a minute. Um, but by the way, the reason I, I bring up that you should contact them is because they apparently will bow to pressure in certain areas. So initially when the list of speakers was put out, one name, one notable name was missing. Andrew Yang wasn't on it. So people complained and now it's official. We've been added to the DNC convention speaker lineup, he tweeted. Thank you Yang Gang and everyone else who made this happen. So thanks to that, they gave Andrew Yang the ability to speak that they often denied him on the debate stage. Maybe if we kick up a little fuss, AUC will get more than a minute. It, 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 will, it will absolutely happen, and here's why. And again, I don't know who, how this is produced, but just from an entertainment standpoint, when you have, uh, when you hire production companies, this will be on what CNN, I'm sure CNN, NBC, it'll be on some major network. Yeah, yes. When you they hire they, they hire production companies to produce these things, right? You have a producer, you have a team of producers who have this very tight run of how this show should go. There's meetings that happen for weeks saying, okay, it's like a chess game. Who can we put here? Who would be most effective here? Mm -hmm. How can we do this here? So it's, it comes down to two people who are just hired to do a job who probably don't even care about who's gonna be on. So when you start talking about it on social media, when there's a chatter, and you all, you always know that it's very loud on social media. Those two people are probably gonna get a memo and an email from someone named Karen or Alyssa or Megan or John or Brad that says, you know what, guys, we need to give AOC more time. Let's do, yeah, let, yeah let, let's 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 do that because they're really mad on Twitter. We can't have them mad on Twitter. So and boom, that's how that happens. Really, yes. it, it, it it's that it happens that quickly, and I've seen it happen that quickly. So I do the. the Please start tweeting because our voices are heard, believe it or not, much louder on social media than sitting an email. I think so. I think so. Yeah, send in, send in those comments, not to me, to them. Make sure that they get it. <laughs> this morning, it booted up the old Twitter, and I saw a tweet that, that surprised me. Um, the content of the tweet was, uh, just in case you thought Biden's candidacy was going to be anything other than completely nuts. Team Trump has released a new video and it has a link. That that's not the part that weirded me out. It was that it was from Herman Cain. And as many people noted in the replies, including Parker Malloy with her, I thought you died. So that's the thing. <laughs> Herman Cain tragically died from coronavirus. His Twitter account tweeted much more today than I did. That seems weird. It's I know that it's 2020, but it's well, John. Why are you questioning if it's weird or not? It's very weird, and it's coming from a ver it's coming from a verified account. It's not from some stand bot account. It's not from some like because some of those accounts that tweet for po posthumously for people, you have to really dig deep to be like, oh, this is not the this is not the official account. Of course, even if it's verified or not, yes, it's very weird. Point. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> like, what else can you say about it? And and I wonder, like, okay, so I looked into it a little bit, and if you look, um, let's go to this next graphic. Um, Andrew Yang, watch out. Now we've got the Kane gang. This is the official Twitter for Team Kane. And again, the main Kane died tragically, mm -hmm. needlessly, because of Donald Trump, most likely. Formerly run by Herman Kane, now supervised by his daughter, team, and family. The mission continues. So look, obviously, if the family wants to do this, and if he gave them access to the account, they get to do this. I'm not arguing with that. But it's it seems a little bit weird that that this guy died just like a week or two ago from a pandemic we're still experiencing. Mm -hmm. And now his Twitter account, as if it were him from beyond the grave, is right. like spreading right wing propaganda and memes and stuff. That just seems 
Like it makes me feel a little bit ill that that this is the world we're in. So like, is this gonna be the standard thing that like no one ever really dies anymore as long as they have a PR team? I don't know, it makes me uncomfortable. So no one ever really dies is the name of Pharrell's band NERD, awesome. Huh. Um, and, and here's the thing, we don't, people grieve in weary ways, right? Maybe this is the family grieving their loss. Who knows what's going on behind closed doors? I just, I, I don't wanna wake up and see a tweet from Michael Jackson's Twitter account about something when when he's been dead for 10 years, but yet all of a sudden his official account is tweeting. I think there there's a level of would would if he was still alive, would he want? I don't know. It, it he is, might. It's, 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 he it's, might. There's, but there's a lot of questions. It's like it's like the hologram thing. Like, should people still be mm. should 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 images and and things that have been been a part of someone's life still be readily available and readily used even after they passed on? There's a whole conversation about that. I don't think they should unless they have and before they died said yes, this is what I want to see happen after I pass on. And maybe he had that conversation with his family. But again, tweeting stuff, tweeting out things that are that are a little inflammatory or kind of you know heated. It's it's mm-hmm. it's it's a it's a slippery slope. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, it, it's a weird one. But if you're looking for a little bit of fun, perhaps you know, although attached to a tragedy, um, go to the replies on that tweet. There's some funny stuff posted down there, and um, I can only predict that the Ken Gang is going to be a hot mess. <laughs> That's <laughs> that would be my guess. Is that it's going to be a hot one. <laughs> uh, Jason, I want to get out in front of the chat because. Since the last time you were on, a thing Uh that the commenters do is, is that everyone who comes on the show has to be designated with a Marvel superhero. Are you a fan of the MCU? Of course, I mean, X Factor, the, the I've read so many Marvel comics growing up. So yeah. if I had to choose, or are you gonna ask me what my who my favorite Marvel character is or who I would be if who, I was a Marvel let, superhero? If, you, if, if the audience had to come back and they're like, this is who we think you are, who would you hope that they say? I would hope they would say I was Quasar, Quasar is awesome, yeah. uh, or, or who, mm, maybe Cloak. Cloak. I, I like the the real kind of destined ones from from the MCU. Not not the not the Captain Americas. The the, the go to ones. There's so many wow. level five mutants in the MCU that kick ass that no one talks about. So hopefully wow. we have some real big Marvel heads in the chat section that will that will <laughs> pin one of those on me. I, I just looked up Cloak and uh, looks awesome. So what's interesting about this is we've had a couple of people come on and say, I don't watch it, I don't know anyone. Uh, we go all the way from that to you where your knowledge is significantly more detailed than my own. I don't know who Cloak is. Quasar I've heard of, but don't really know. I didn't read many comics growing up and the ones I did weren't necessarily Marvel, but it's mostly Spawn basically. Um, but anyway, good choices. Let's see what the audience thinks. Uh, Rob Shively says, how about Moon Knight, Jason? Are you a fan Moon? of Moon Knight? Um, I'll, I will take Moon Knight only because I like the way he acquired his powers. See, some of these mutants get their powers in ways that aren't, they're not born with these powers, mm-hmm. right? They're either, they're either given to him by like an ancient, an ancient ancestor who now resides inside the person's being. Yeah. Those stories are cool. Yeah, you could be born a level five mutant, a Jean Grey, a Polaris, a Magneto. But when you go somewhere and you stumble into someone who's like, you know what, I think you're cool. Much like it's a Shazam, even though Shazam's DC. Those are cool origin stories. Yeah. I've never been happier on the show than I am right now. <laughs> Can I just say that? <laughs> um, okay, I'm gonna try. I don't know much about Moon Knight, although I thought, I've always thought that Moon Knight looks awesome. And I remember playing him in one of the Marvel games. Um, uh-huh. He got his power because like an Egyptian god gave him yes, to him? Yes, um, oh. Um, uh, with O, with an O, it starts with an O, it's with an O, but don't yeah. Know. Okay, awesome, awesome, okay. Uh, Lisa Burdick says, if Jason is Cloak, who on TYT would be his dagger? It would if it by dagger it would have to be the TYT Beyonce Anna Kasparian or I mean oh or, or no 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 it could be Aida Rodriguez she could be my dad she could be my my, oh, my dad oh she hasn't been I don't think that she's gotten a, a hero yet okay we might have to go for that we might uh, let's see um, Kenny from Philly says Jason is definitely cloak um, Karanik says Moon Knight got powers from Egyptian god Khonshu. Um, and Maymakin said the same. Yes, um, exactly. Yeah. 
Um, we have some people, Carlton over on Twitter also was giving us updates about Moon Knight. A lot of Moon Knight stands in the, in the audience today. People, this wait. people love them. They love the B-side superheroes, man. People are tired of the lead singles. They want the B-sides when it comes to their Marvel <laughs> superheroes. No, they, they don't. Yes, Spidey, sure, Iron Man, Thor, whatever. They're played out. Give us the real good mm. ones. Yeah, I gotta say, I never really got, I never really got Spider-Man. Like I watched the Tobey Maguire, I thought it was fine. Um, but I watched, you know, a couple months back, I played the PS4 Spider-Man game, and I watched uh-huh. the Tom Holland Spider-Man movies, and I thought. I sort of get why he's one of the biggest. He's fun. He's fun. He's fun. They need to do, they need to give X Men the Dark Knight treatment. Make it real dark, <laughs> subversive. Stop booking these young kids to play these roles. <laughs> Make sure, or do a whole Storm movie just on sure, Storm. Sure. And her origin. And really, the 2000 X Men movie, which I, Brian Singer did an okay job. But I liked it. I liked it. And because it was, it was a one different of the time. Works. Right, it was one of the first. I mean, before we had really good CGI, and then of course in the 2000s, X X Men United, X The Last Stand. But Storm is so powerful and gets no play, and never have Halle Berry play her again, or Alexandra Ship. Maybe I don't know, Alec Weck or someone that's just like different. Yeah. That would be killer. That uh, that MCU needs to get into it. Um, I thought. Natalie Emanuel would be good. And then someone came back a few months ago. We had a discussion about who should play Storm, and they came back with the perfect name, but now I don't remember, unfortunately. Oh, well, I'm sure chat will have some good suggestions. But anyway, um, yeah, no, I, I look, the dark treatment, I think it'd be fine. I just want to see what an X-Men made to MCU standards would look like. I'm dreading the casting because mm-hmm. they really nailed that part of it the first time around. But I want to see it. I like X Men. That was like that of the comics I read. It was X Men. So anyway. right. Well, here's the beauty. Before we go, here's the beauty that now that Disney owns 21st Century Fox, which has produced all the X Men movies previously, um, maybe they can. And, and of course, Disney owns Marvel Studios. Maybe we'll get. You know, we'll 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 get that final, finally, a good X Men movie that that'll do it justice and not yeah. hire these like young kids to play these maybe. amazing superheroes. Maybe Lupita. That's a pretty. That's a that's hard to argue against. Hard to argue again, or I think Lupita, or who else would be? I don't know. Like there's Carrie Washington. There's so many great black actresses mm-hmm. that could play this role that would kill it. Viola, <laughs> throw Viola Davis in the mix. Yeah, maybe that would that would be. You get the drama definitely. Drama. But um, I saw some suggestions in the chat for Storm, and uh, whoever keeps saying Helena Bonham Carter, no, stop it. <laughs> Stop it, the, I love her, no. <laughs> for, okay, first of all, the only movies that Helena Bonham Carter belongs in are ones by Tim Burton, her husband or ex-husband, I'm not sure if there's married, and Harry Potter. She's a, and, or, or maybe she'll reprise her role in Fight Club. Yeah, that, she was great in all those. I really like her personally, but no, <laughs> she's not gonna be Storm. Obviously, no. Storm is gonna be played by Scarlett Johansson. Oh, uh, no, okay, anyway. no, first of all, we're not gonna contribute to the whitewashing of <laughs> Storm. Here on the damage report. Move on. <laughs> Move on. Okay, no more talk about Storm, everybody. Let's talk well, about no. how are you gonna have another Wolverine? Solve that problem, chat. How could you choose another Wolverine after the last 10 years? You know who would be a you know who would be a great Wolverine? Uh Hugh Jackman. That's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> I could see it. I think he right, be. <laughs> God, he'd be great as Wolverine. God, God, Hugh, that, 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 look, that that does it offer him the role now. Mm-hmm. No, no, Reed, just give it to him. Yeah, I thought you were gonna say like, who's the guy that played? It was in that last Mission Impossible. I could kind of see that maybe. I don't know, but no, it has to be Hugh. Um, Henry Cavill. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Henry Cavill played Superman. You, I know no, you can't do both. Yeah, no, no, we're not doing that. Yeah, no. Um, however, really fast, I want to acknowledge someone said Bill Barr is Wolverine. That's kind of funny. And uh, another, so the, it, it's storm. The storm controversy continues. Um, someone recommended Tandy Newton, and I have to say, oh, yes. After watching Westworld, yes, yes, yeah, she yeah. would be Tandy a great. Kill it. it would be. Like it's, it, these are different storms that we're laying out, but it would be a good one. It would be a good one. She would be great. Also, she yeah. was a Mission Impossible back in the early 2000s. I remember. Um, and 
She's just, she is, I, I got to meet her on the set of Drag Race. She's an incredible woman. And for, you know, that, that's the thing. And look, Halle Berry would be great again if they would just give Halle better wigs and better lines and just a better, like an, an overall Halle superhero makeover. But Tanya Newton would smash it with yeah. Slay Storm. No, it would be. It would be everything. And it's not like I'm not like an expert on Storm in the comics. I'm sure there's some stuff I don't get about that, but I think that she'd be really good. I would say also, um, Holly Berry was really good in John Wick. Like they gave her oh. bad lines in those old on those old X-Men movies. Like so part of it isn't really on her. <laughs> Well, John, I interviewed Halle Berry at the John Wick Parabellum premiere huh? last uh, last year, and we and her character Sophia. We talked about what it took for her to get in in shape and be prepared for that role. I mean, that was six mm -hmm. weeks, twelve hour days. Halle's die hard, and she's fifty three years old and still can kick some ass. So I, again, yeah. Halle, they, it's an actor is only as good as the script and the directing and and the direction that they're given. Yeah, yeah, I could still see it. I mean, I, if I if I had to choose, I'd go Tandy. I think, or maybe Lupita. Same. I don't know. Oh, I can see both. Anyway, um, let's have let's see some audition tapes. I'm just gonna say uh, to I think it was Miles in the chat, uh, Phoebe Waller Bridge's Storm. No, never. She's ne a never treasure. But no. <laughs> you don't like her? No, I mean, Flea Fleabag was not that good. I'll leave it at that. <gasps> It wasn't, I'm sorry, it was not. You know what's really good though? <laughs> you know what you should get into? What? Selling Sunset on Netflix. Oh, I, don't, oh, I, don't, I thought that was a real estate show, <laughs> is it not? It's a complete real estate show and oh. it's, great, it's great television, really good television. Is Phoebe Waller-Bridge in it? No, but I just I just wanted to segue away from the Phoebe Waller-Bridge situation because I know I'm gonna get flamed for saying Fleabag isn't good. I don't, find, well, like, mm. Killing Eve, she's behind yeah, that. Yeah, well, absolutely, 100%. Jodie Comer and Sandra O, oh, incredible. But I will say this last season was nowhere near as good as the first one. Yeah. And yeah. also, it's like Handmaid's Tale, right? You have four seasons coming up, and the, when you run out of the initial content from the books that shape the story, and you start going off into your own like weird mm -hmm. narratives, you you kind of lose the magic. Remember that yeah, show, Revenge? That was on ABC Revenge back I in the day. Didn't see it. I didn't see it. So good. First two yeah. seasons, incredible. The third one, garbage. That's what's happening with a lot of these shows. Yeah, I will say I read the books for um, Killing Eve and wasn't a huge fan. I, honestly, and the, the the best draw of the show is Jodie Comer, and her character mm -hmm. in the books was not very good. She, it's like all right. her. She needs to get in the MCU, by the way. You know what? She can play Storm. Actually, let's have Jodie Comer as Storm. Anyway. John, no, Storm is a black female. <laughs> what are we I'm kidding? <laughs> I'm kidding. That's like having Julia Roberts is gonna play Harriet Tubman. Uh-huh. Sure. Oh my god. Yes, that's true. What about like Rogue? I don't know. We'll we'll talk. We'll figure it out. Trump supporters on Snapchat are just trying to go about their lives and maybe share a meme or two, and they're being preyed upon by grifters. And joining us now to break it down with some great reporting, reporter for HuffPost, Jessalyn Cook. Welcome back to the damage report. Thank you for having me. Uh, glad to have you on. So you had a really fascinating article not long ago on HuffPost about um, some ads you'd found that were targeting younger Trump supporting Snapchatters. Can you tell us a little bit about those ads? Yes, ads were running on Snapchat that had been micro targeted to young people living in red states who liked watching Fox News, who had conservative leaning interests and they were promoting Basically, just a lot of free Trump swag, whether it's hats, shirts, um, pool floats, and you know, <laughs> big free letters popping out at you: buy it for free or get it for free. And of course, there's a catch uh, when you swipe up and you get to the the page that is selling the product. There, in buried in fine print, it says that you are actually going to be signed up for a very costly monthly membership, which would be easy for a teenager to miss. Yeah, so that that's that's a catch, but it's it's not just that you have to pay for your pool float or whatever. You are you're getting locked into something that's actually far more expensive. And in I think in one case that you reference, it's $142 every single month with no ability to get a refund. So that's a significant financial outlay, if non-consensual, especially for younger Americans. Yeah, it's very deceptive. It says you just need to put in your credit card information to cover the cost of shipping and then you get your free Trump hat. But if you pay attention to your credit card bill, you'll see $142 every month going forward. 
Do we have any idea of how successful these ads have been? Have you have you seen people talking about getting duped by these these sorts of grifters? Yeah, I, I spoke to a couple Trump supporters who said they had been duped by uh, these ads. They didn't want to talk to me on the record for an article. A lot of Trump supporters don't like the media, um, <laughs> but really, know, yeah, shocking. Um, but. You know, I would say that the scale of these ads shows how successful they are. Some of these companies, these predatory companies running these ads have been doing so unabated for months and have spent like hundreds of thousands of dollars pouring into these ads. So presumably probably bringing in millions of dollars that no one actually wanted to give them. So these companies that you've identified that are doing this, um, is this a violation in any way of Snapchat's terms of service? Is Snapchat going to do anything? Do they consider this to be a problem? Yeah, Snapchat has policies prohibiting false or misleading ads. And Snapchat also, every ad goes through human review. So it's hard to understand how so many of these slip through the cracks. They also do quality checks. And after I reached out to Snapchat and flagged a bunch of these ads, they stopped working with those advertisers. So not sure how they missed that first time around. Interesting, and um, you know, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna be completely honest. While I spend a lot of time on Twitter and a little bit of time on Instagram, mostly for work, I have spent very little time on Snapchat, so I don't know much about the current state of it in terms of advertising. Is there anything sort of baked into Snapchat that makes it a good spot for companies to do these sorts of predatory ads? The young user base, it's a lot of young people on Snapchat, um, and you know, Snapchat has like. Other tech platforms that can let you get very specific with who you want to show your ads to. So if you want to target teenagers, if you want to target people even with certain geographic coordinates, you can get pretty specific at who with who sees your ad. And so it it does leave a lot of room open for nefarious nefarious activity when you are kind of sidestepping transparency in that way and just showing ads to very siloed audiences. Exactly, and then potentially, I mean, sort of the implication of some of what you were saying, having Snapchat then provide a little bit of um, a blockage to transparency on your behalf, implying that they're following their terms of service, but in in reality, not really seeming to do so. Um, so you explain the idea of micro targeting, um, dark ads. What are those? Yeah, a dark ad is just that. It's if I wanted to show an ad promoting a specific product only to people in a certain geographic area or only people who are interested in one thing or another, I could do so using Facebook, Snapchat, a bunch of platforms. And you know, they, they make it very easy to do this. And it makes sense if you're trying to sell, I think the article, the example I use in my article is cat food. Like you could just show your dark ad just to people who have cats and who live near your business. But it gets to be more problematic when you're running things like scams or Facebook actually used to make it possible to specifically hide ads from ethnic affinities, which opened the gates for like housing discrimination and just all kinds of racist ads. So there are, there's a lot of concern surrounding dark ads. Do, do we have any reason to believe that that's one of the, the sorts of filters you can apply in micro targeting on Snapchat along Snapchat? racial or religious or? No, they uh, platforms are pretty careful now. That came out, uh, I think, ahead of the 2016 election, and platforms are very careful about not letting you be openly racist in their ads. Um, yeah. <laughs> but it it opens the gates for problems too with um, political campaigns, like sending one message to one group of people that no one else is going to see, and then changing their tone and saying something else to another a different yeah. targeted audience. So I fear that because of the nature of the group that you're talking about that's being targeted is they're you know Trump fans, they're conservative. Some of our audience might not be 100% sympathetic towards them, but I obviously feel bad. If you're some random 18 year old, I mean, I remember if I had been locked into some sort of $142 a month payment, that would have been the end for me effectively. So I obviously feel bad for them, but I'm, but I'm curious in your research that you've done, have you found any equivalents of this sort of predatory behavior targeting like Biden fans or Bernie fans or anything like that? I haven't. Um, I did write about a similar uh, scam on Facebook uh, run by Mike Huckabee's company. Uh, he runs a history for kids <laughs> company and he was doing the same kind of bait and switch scheme there. So it definitely, you can do this on many different platforms, but I have seen a lot more of this kind of grifting on right wing pages than left wing. Interesting. I wonder. 
Yeah, I mean, it would be pure speculation, but I wonder if it has more to do with a perhaps they're more likely to fall into it or if it's just the nature of the people doing the grifting, I wonder. Um, but also I'm curious just because we have you here and, and you you obviously know Snapchat a lot better than I do. We've been talking a lot over the past year about the changing um, stances towards political advertising on Twitter and, and Facebook especially. How much they're going to allow in terms of how inaccurate the things you say can be. Do we have an idea of what the standards are for Snapchat for actual candidate or otherwise political ads? They, as other platforms are kind of shying away from political ads or giving users more control over what they see. Snapchat is kind of going in the opposite direction and really aggressively pursuing political ads. And I think, um, you know, People our age are less familiar with Snapchat, and so it kind of flies under the radar a bit. But there is, I would say, room for this kind of deceptive advertising for political, for politicians and campaigns as well. So we'll just have to keep a close eye on it. Okay, and I appreciate that you're doing that. Um, you know, every time you come on the show, we learn a little bit more about what's going on in social <laughs> media sites than I knew before. Uh, so, Jesslyn Cook, I, I really appreciate you you joining us as always. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.